Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our talk today. Welcome to training a new generation of data scientists. My name is Josh Wills. Uh, I am Cloudera's Senior Director of Data Science. I've been with Cloudera for about 18 months now, and my job here is to work with Cloudera's customers to develop data-intensive, um, large-scale analytical applications on top of Apache Hadoop. Um, I work with in industries as diverse as bioinformatics, web stuff, consumer finance, medicine, oil and gas, really just about any industry uh, where we need to make use, intelligent use of large amounts of data in order to make better decisions. Before was, I was at Cloudera, I did about four years at Google. Uh, my first job at Google was working on the ad auction, so deciding where on the web page different ads should go and how much different people should pay. My job after that was building data infrastructure, so everything related to logging, uh, experiments and A-B testing, developing machine learning models like friend recommendation systems. A lot of it got used in Google News, a lot of it got used in Google Plus, a lot of it got used in mobile search. So I've been very lucky to do really just about anything you could possibly do uh, in large-scale data processing, Hadoop, and MapReduce for the last five years or so. Um, so all that said, um, if I was to die tomorrow, uh, the thing that I would be most remembered for is this tweet, uh, which is a definition of data scientist, what it means to be a data scientist. So my definition is a data scientist is someone who is better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician. And so, you know, if you think about it to the extent that, you know, it's, you can make a definition in less than 140 characters and, and have it be good and meaningful, um, this is a pretty good definition of what it means to be a data scientist. And to the extent that being retweeted a lot is indicative of credibility, um, a lot of people basically agree with me on this one. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, like, what exactly it is I do as a data scientist. So... I think there's a, lot of different, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what data scientists do. Um, and unfortunately, some of those misconceptions come from data scientists themselves. Um, so let's go through sort of different perspectives on what data scientists do. There's sort of in one level, there's what I think I do. Um, and I think of myself primarily as a mathematician. Um, I think that I work on math problems. Um, I formulate abstract ideas. I write up lots of equations on boards. And then I find ways to implement those ideas and make them a reality. So I really think of myself as a math nerd, first and foremost. All right. Um, in the popular conception, though, I think the popular conception of data scientists is sort of like uh, Tom Cruise in Minority Report. So if you've ever seen this movie, Tom Cruise spends lots of time visualizing data. There's a big kind of grid, and he can move data and information around on the grid. Because most of what people see about data scientists in the public are really cool data visualizations. So I think my parents assume that I spend most of my days with big computer monitors, you know, moving data sets around and, and looking at them and that kind of stuff. That's what other people think I do, all right? But in terms of what I really do, um, the best analogy I could come up with was uh, Forrest Gump. There's a scene in Forrest Gump where Forrest and Bubba uh, have their toothbrushes and they're cleaning the floor of the barracks with a toothbrush. That's actually a pretty good description of what I spend most of my time doing. Um, I spend the vast majority of my time cleaning data sets, preparing data sets. There's a whole bunch of data, and I have a little tiny toothbrush, and I, I clean data. That's really what I do. Um, the reason I do that is because cleansing data sets, preparing data sets, making them better, um, makes everything I do better. It makes my machine learning models better. It makes the inferences that I make for uh, business leaders, business executives better. It makes my dashboards more accurate. Uh, cleaning data, incorporating new data sets, um, t like joining different data sets together, this is the highest value activity I do. And that's what I spend the vast majority of my time doing. All right? So that's different conceptions of, of what it is to be a data scientist. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how the term data scientist emerged. For the first 10 years or so of my career, um, I was either called a software engineer or I was called a statistician, uh, depending on where I was working. I was always doing the same kind of work, though. I was always analyzing large amounts of data um, and creating information and creating data products, uh, information that was used by other people to make decisions. Um, so I'm particularly grateful for the, the term data scientist because it makes it much easier for me to describe to people what exactly it is I do. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the term emerged, though. And I think in order to do that, we have to think a little bit about the history of data storage and how 
data has been analyzed historically, um, especially about 10 or 12 years ago. All right, so let's go back in time a little bit to 2001 or so. So if it's 2001 and I have a bunch of data lying around and I need to analyze it and process it and store it, what are my options? What technology is available to me? All right. So option number one is a database. And a database is a fantastic option. I love relational databases. They've been very, very good to me over the years. All right. So let's talk about what's great about relational databases. Um, first and foremost, they have structured schemas. So I define a table definition up front, and I promise all the data that I load in is going to in load into that table is going to meet that schema definition. Okay. Um, the best part about having structured schemas is it means that I can do information processing where the data is stored. This is really actually a very cool idea. If I can send a very tiny little SQL query to a database. Um, the database can do an enormous amount of processing on that little itty bitty tiny SQL query um, and then return a relatively small data set to me as a result. All right? This is a really great idea and it's a lot more efficient than say me reading all the data off the database, doing whatever processing I want to do with it, and then writing it back to the database again. Okay. Uh, databases are pretty reliable. I'm probably backing up my database every day or so, but for the most part they're very reliable. Um, and the challenge with databases is that they tend to get a little bit expensive when I start scaling them up. That's like the big sort of constraint around databases. As my data sets get larger and larger and larger, um, the amount of money I have to spend on database hardware and database system administrators and database software uh, goes up a, a, a lot. <laughs> data storage, my other option, my other option is to use a filer, to use network attached storage, to use a storage area network. All right. Now, filers are fantastic because I can store any kind of data I want. I don't have to specify a schema up front, so I can store video, I can store time series data, I can store images, I can store audio, I can store anything I like. I can put it all in the file system. Okay? No schema is required, no failures in the case that the data coming in doesn't match the schema. This is great stuff. The downside is that I don't have any data processing capability. So anytime I want to do any processing on this data, I need to read it off of the file system, do whatever processing I'm going to do, and then write it back again. All right, so I give up the data processing capability um, in exchange for not having a data schema. The great thing about filers is they are extremely reliable. In fact, that's exactly what you're paying so much money for. A filer is essentially promising, I will never, ever, ever lose your data. Um, and much like databases, filers have the problem that they tend to be very expensive at scale. So as I'm trying to store hundreds, tens, hundreds, thousands of terabytes of data in a file system, uh, the amount of money I'm going to spend for hardware and software goes through the roof. So it's 2001. Those are my data storage options, databases and filers. All right. Then what happens? Over the last 10 years, we have had a ridiculous explosion in data volumes. Right? Everything from web application logs to web pages to sensors to social media data, we've had just simply a ridiculous explosion in the amount of data that we need to store and process. All right, so we're really pushing the limits of what traditional database and filer technologies can do in a cost-effective manner. All right. In addition to that, uh, we have a shift in what I call data economics. All right, so this is, this is classical data economics. This is the notion of return on byte. All right. The classical idea of return on byte is how much value can I extract from any byte of data that I'm storing? All right, how much value, what is that worth to me? And how much does it cost me to store that byte of data? Now, if the ratio of those two quantities, if the value I can extract is greater than the cost, then I'm going to keep the data online. I'm going to keep it in a database. I'm going to keep it in a filer. But if the, cost is, if the ratio is less than one, if it costs more to store this data than, it does, uh, than the amount of value I can get out of the data, then I'm either going to just throw the data away or I'm going to put the data on tape, which, as we all know, is a very expensive way to throw away data. Along with that, we have, we have a new idea, a uh, new idea that I call big data economics. All right? The notion of big data economics is I have some sort of data sets, some data sets where no individual record is particularly valuable, but having an enormous collection of records is incredibly valuable. All right? The classic example of this is the web. All right? Everybody in this room right now has a laptop, has a mobile phone, and that laptop and phone has a cache of web pages in it. So everyone in here has a few hundred web pages stored in their computer. Not really worth much of anything. 
But if you have 8 billion web pages, you can build a search engine, and a search engine is ridiculously valuable. Everyone in this room right now uh, probably has a receipt or a few, a few dozen receipts either in their pocket or stored in their email, right? Individual receipt, not really worth much of anything. But if you have a billion receipts, you can be like Amazon and build the world's greatest product recommendation engine, which is also incredibly valuable. We have lots of domains where this kind of new big data economics applies. Um, gene sequencing, retail analytics, right? Um, the process of finding oil. All of these different systems um, have situations where we need to study the relationship between observations. We study the relationship between people. We study the relationships between web pages. And studying relationships of big data sets uh, makes them absolutely enormous, makes them ridiculously huge. All right. So, increase in data volume, changing data economics. Enter Hadoop. Hadoop is an open source um, project developed at the Apache Software Foundation that is designed to handle this new world. This new world of enormous data sets and this new world of big data economics, where we need to be in the business of studying relationships between things. Um, real quick, on the sort of quick overview of Hadoop, between the different components of Hadoop. The first component, first core component, is the Hadoop distributed file system. All right? A Hadoop distributed file system is based on the Google file system. So Google's file system is a little bit unusual. Um, most file systems, like the file system on your laptop, um, maps names of files to little tiny blocks of data typically about four kilobyte blocks of data. The file system keeps track of how those file names map to blocks of data stored on disk. Um, in Hadoop's file system, we use enormous blocks. Instead of four kilobytes, we use 256 megabytes, typically, as a block size. All right? Blocks are huge, huge chunks of data. So we're typically working with enormous files on Hadoop, files that are tens, hundreds of gigabytes in size, even terabyte size files. That's totally fine on Hadoop. In fact, it's really what we want. Um, all of these blocks are then replicated to multiple nodes in the cluster. Uh, each block will be replicated to three nodes on the cluster. Um, typically, we'll have two copies stored on each rack, different servers on a single rack, and then one copy stored on some other rack. And the genius of this is that if any particular node in the system goes down, that's OK. Hadoop detects that this has happened and replicates copies of the blocks from other servers that have that block um, to other nodes in the system. So we always have three copies of every uh, particular file stored and available to us. And the virtue of this is this gives us reliable data storage on unreliable hardware. When I tell people about HDFS, people often ask me, um, how did Google come up with this idea? How did Google come up with the notion of GFS in the first place? Why did they start doing this? Um, and the reason is that people don't really think of this, but back in the day, back in 2000, 2001, um, Google really didn't have very much money. They hadn't discovered AdWords as a business model yet. So they had a lot of very unreliable hardware, and they needed to store a couple of copies of the Internet. So what Google would do was literally make copies of files. They would literally copy files by hand to multiple machines in their data storage clusters. And they developed GFS uh, essentially to just automate that process and make it easier for them to do something they were already doing manually. All right. So this is pretty great, right? We have now stored a reliably distributed copy of enormous data sets on top of cheap, um, unreliable commodity hardware. This is a really great situation. Um, that said, we have a lot of processing we need to do. In fact, we need to build, at least in Google's case, they needed to actually build a search engine. And we have all these CPUs sitting around, not really doing much of anything. So how can we like, put them to use analyzing our data? So to do that, Google developed a programming framework called MapReduce. And MapReduce is simple, reliable, distributed processing over enormous data sets stored in HDFS. Now MapReduce breaks problems down into three separate stages. The map stage is the embarrassingly parallel stage. You can think of every single record in our data set being processed one at a time by the map stage. Um, the map is going to emit key value pairs. All right. The shuffle stage is kind of the brains of the operation, and it's built into the MapReduce programming framework itself. Now, what the shuffle stage is going to do is take all those keys and values that were emitted by the map stage and sort them by key, so that all the values for the same key are grouped together on multiple different nodes in the system. 
And then finally, in the reduce stage, we're going to take all the values for a single key and process them all at once. Let's do some sort of big aggregation or big collation on top of all these individual values. The cool idea of MapReduce is that much like a database, we're processing the data where it is stored. The code for our map and reduce functions is very small. It can be just a little bit of Java or Python or Ruby code. And we're sending this tiny amount of code to an enormous amount of data. Just like with a database, we send a tiny query to the database server. We send a tiny bit of code to the Hadoop cluster, and it does all the processing where the data is stored. The cool thing, though, is that unlike a database server, we get to structure the data however we want. And that means we can use MapReduce to analyze things like uh, serialized objects, like images, like audio files, like log files. Things that don't naturally fit into a typical database schema can be processed on Hadoop using MapReduce. The really great thing for me, as speaking as a software engineer, before I started writing MapReduce jobs about five years ago, I spent a lot of my time uh, rewriting software whenever the volume of data I had to process went up by a factor of two or five or ten. Right? I had to rewrite whatever I had written to process that data in order to be sure that I could process it in whatever time frame I had available to me. And with MapReduce, I don't have to do that anymore. I basically, once I've written a job as a MapReduce, in order to scale it out, I just throw more hardware at the problem. That's all I have to do. I don't have to rewrite any code. And this is a really huge benefit for me as a software engineer, and it's a really huge benefit for all of my employers because my time is very expensive and I have lots of work to do. So it's a lot cheaper to just throw more hardware at a problem instead of forcing me to rewrite systems over and over and over again. That's, that's really that's the power of MapReduce. Thinking like a data scientist. Um, first, as a data scientist, I always want to solve a problem. There's nothing worse for me than if a business person comes to me with a whole bunch of data and says, here you go, here's a whole bunch of data, find me some insights. Just go, go nuts, go find the insights in my data set. This is, this is really, this is the worst thing that can happen to me, right? Um, what I want to do is solve a problem. So if I'm talking to a business person, I want to say, tell me about a problem you have and let's talk about data intensive ways we can solve that problem. And that can be any problem from customer retention to reducing costs, to detecting anomalous events, whatever it is. Let's talk about the problems you have to solve. Let's develop some data systems for solving them. And I guarantee you, in the process of solving that problem, we will discover some insights. But insights don't typically occur in a vacuum. That's not really the way things work. Insights come when we solve interesting, meaningful problems. The second thing I want to do as a data scientist is parallelize everything I do. Uh, iterate as fast as possible on the problems that I'm trying to solve. I have, I have a favorite story, a little allegory here that I like to tell. Um, back in the 50s, there was an XPRIZE style contest to develop a human-powered airplane. So an airplane didn't run on any fuel besides what could be generated by a human being under their own power. All right? And so the way this worked was there was like a $50,000 prize and you get a bunch of graduate students together and come up with a design and work for about a year or so and come up with an initial model of like an airplane, right? And then we would go to test out the airplane and it would crash after like 10 seconds, right? Plane crashes, totally goes to bits. Um, so they're like, huh, okay. Let's uh, come up with a new design, get a new set of graduate students, work for another year, and then we'll come up with another design and test it out and it will crash after 20 seconds, right? And this went on for about 10 years or so, just like this. A bunch of different people coming up with designs, building them for nine months to a year, testing them out, having them crash. All right. Until finally a guy comes along and he says, the problem is we're solving the wrong problem. We don't want to try to build a human-powered airplane. We want to try to build an airplane that we can put back together in a matter of days or in a matter of hours. And that was exactly what he did he decided to start building airplanes that he could basically put back together really, really quickly after they crashed. So he built his first airplane like this and tested it out, and it crashed after like five seconds. But that was okay. He could build the plane back up again, reassemble it, try it out again the next day, try it out again the day after that. He got to a point where he could actually try out multiple designs on a single day under some circumstances. 
And he ended up solving the problem of human-powered flight in about six months. Because in that six-month period, he tried out more ideas than everybody else had in the preceding 10-year period. Um, that's a lot of what we do as data scientists. There's this great quote from Thomas Edison um, about invention being 1% uh, innovation and 99% perspiration. And that very much applies to data science as well. The next idea that takes a little bit of getting used to uh, is data abundance versus data scarcity. Uh, with Hadoop, when we start thinking about doing data analysis on Hadoop, we have to move from a model where we have a relatively constrained pool of data available to us and a relatively constrained pool of data warehousing resources, say maybe like 10 terabytes or 25 terabytes or something like that, to where we have virtually unlimited data resources. We can actually store as much data as we want in Hadoop very cheaply and cost effectively. Uh, right now, 100 commodity nodes, 100 commodity servers, stores a petabyte of data on Hadoop. That is an enormous amount of data. And that has a lot of implications for how we work and how we, work, how we use data when we're working with Hadoop. We move from a model where we just go get exactly the data we know we need ahead of time to going and getting everything we could possibly want. And we move from just running analyses once and then storing temporary tables and then having them go away after a while to keeping all of our intermediate results around. Keeping all of the intermediate results, keeping every idea we've ever tried, keeping everything because it doesn't really cost us anything to keep it around anymore. It's just as cheap to keep everything as it was before to keep a very small amount of data. And this ends up changing how we work and how we think about problems in a pretty fundamental way. When you can keep absolutely everything and always be able to go back and look at ideas you tried before and try them out again with slight variations. Talking about building data products, a lot of what data scientists do is build data products. Um, we have to move from a model where a data scientist conducts an analysis in response to a question um, to a point where a data scientist can build a dashboard or a machine learning model or a search engine or some other kind of tool the data scientists can use to help other people who are less sophisticated um, do analyses and get insights themselves. So building data products is how you scale up um, both yourself as a data scientist uh, and a data science team. Creating a data science team. Being a data scientist involves a number of different skills. You have to have some software engineering knowledge, you have to know some statistics, you have to know some machine learning, you have to know some data visualization, you have to have expertise in particular business areas. There's lots of stuff you need to know how to do. Uh, and the reality is nobody knows how to do everything. It's simply not possible for one person to have all these different skills. So what we end up doing is creating data science teams. Now, the structure of a data science team is very similar to the structure of a data warehousing team. There will be sort of an overall architecture for our data science products that we create. Um, there will be a data engineering team that specializes in data extraction, data cleansing, data processing. Um, and there will be a more analysis-focused data science team, people who are stronger in statistics and statistical analysis and data visualization who will be large consumers of this data. Um, but the point is that everybody needs to understand every part of the system. Uh, there's nothing more important to being a data scientist than communication and being able to converse um, both with software engineers and with statisticians and with business users. You really have to be able to talk to everybody on the team. The other thing that's a little bit different about data science teams is that data moves in a sort of full life cycle. For a typical data warehousing team, we're always basically taking data from operational systems and sending it off to the data warehouse. Uh, but in data science, a lot of the time what we're doing is taking models that we create from analyzing that data and then shipping it back to the operational system. So we're either creating some kind of fraud model or some kind of advertising model or some kind of product recommendation model. So we have to have skills not only in analyzing data, but also in deploying models to production systems. Um, being a data scientist involves some of the skills around uh, DevOps, the ability to actually like deploy code into production, not just analyze it in an offline fashion. Choosing good problems. Really, really important to be a successful data scientist and having a successful data science team at your company uh, is choosing problems well. I have, a, I have a sort of rule of thumb I like to use. Uh, as a data scientist, you should never solve a problem exactly once. 
you should either solve it zero times, which is to say, don't bother solving it, or you should be willing to solve it over and over and over and over again. It is never the case that we want to build a single machine learning model to solve some problem. What we really want to do is come up with a set of metrics we'd like to optimize, whether that's revenue or customer retention or cost savings or whatever they are, some set of metrics, um, and then focus on doing every single thing we can to optimize those metrics. Developing tens, hundreds, thousands of models, as many models as it takes for us to solve that problem. We want to be sure we choose good problems, problems that are important enough for us to keep iterating on them over and over and over again. Designing a machine learning model is almost always like building a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, it's like that in every company everywhere, right? The models are incredibly complicated. They have all kinds of little hooks and nooks and crannies and feedback loops and exception handlers, all kinds of complicated stuff around designing our model. And the reason we do that is because it's essentially never the case that we're trying to optimize a single thing in a data science problem. Uh, let's take the example of advertising. Let's try to say we're trying to design an ad system, right? So obviously we would want to build a machine learning model that will predict the probability of someone clicking on an ad. It's a very natural thing to do, right? Um, the reality is though, the thing that we're trying to optimize is not always the thing that the machine learning model is designed to do, okay? In building an ad prediction model, my goal is not to necessarily predict what ads you're going to click on. It's to come up with a machine learning model that makes the most revenue for my business. That's what I'm really trying to do. And so what can often happen is that the machine learning model that is best at doing ad prediction is not necessarily the one that makes me the most money. And this can happen for any number of reasons. There are budget effects for advertisers. I don't know how deploying a new model will change the way advertisers submit their bids. I don't know how users will react to this new model, right? There's all kinds of complexity and factors that need to be incorporated into your model. And so it not, it's rarely ever the case that we get a good, pure, clean, mathematically elegant model um, in the real world. So if we're paralyzing every single thing we do, uh, and we're solving models over and over and over again, and we're building very big, complicated models, one of our primary goals is to amortize the costs of things we do. That is to say, we want to basically pay the cost of doing some amount of work uh, one time and then have that problem solved for us as we, solve our, as we create new models over and over and over and over again. All right? So for instance, we want to amortize the cost of data collection. We don't want to have to go back to our production systems every single time. We want to gather some, we want to include some new feature or calculate some new metric. We want to be sure that we go get all of our data one time. All right? If we're deploying tens or hundreds of models, we want to be sure that the process for deploying that model, when that model is ready to go through testing and validation and production deployment, we want to be sure that process is completely automated for us. Right? Every single thing we're going to do, we're going to do over and over and over again. So we want to invest the time in making sure that doing those things that we're going to do over and over and over again um, is as cheap and efficient and reliable as possible. We want to be amortizing costs. So because we have this gap between what our models are trying to optimize and the business problem we're trying to solve, the way that we know that our machine learning model is good is by measuring its actual performance on live users, on actual users in production settings, or actual prediction environments, whatever the case may be. Right? We want to measure every single thing we do um, so that we understand the implications of our model and how it will perform at scale. That's really how we understand whether or not something is doing what we expect it to do. And it's also how we gain insights about our system. When we're building big, complicated machine learning models, we may not necessarily fully understand how they work, but we do want to be able to generate insights and understanding about how the system behaves as a whole so we have some idea of new products we can create, new data sources we can introduce, anything we can do to make our systems better um, and to do a better, job, a better job of optimizing the goals we're trying to optimize. So we measure everything we do. And that's it. We measure everything we do. We design models. We amortize costs. Um, and we try out new ideas. That's really all we do. Rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Uh, that's, that's the way of the data scientist. That's how we think about problems. So that's thinking like a data scientist. 
Let's talk a little bit about working like a data scientist. How exactly do you go about becoming one? Uh, we at Cloudera have developed uh, a full curriculum to take you from the very lowest levels, the guts of Hadoop and MapReduce development, all the way up to the highest levels of thinking about business problems, and developing complete Hadoop solutions. Let's talk a little bit about those right now. So at the bottom of the stack is our Hadoop developer training. And this is the foundation for everything else you do. This course is designed for software engineers, uh, Java developers, people who want to really understand uh, the fine-grained guts of Hadoop. Every single trick, um, every single detail of how MapReduce processing works, um, all the benefits of HDFS, all that good stuff. It is the core foundation for everything else you do. Really, really important to start here. Now, as you move up the stack, you're going to find that you're going to want to automate a lot of the low-level details of Hadoop and MapReduce processing for you. And that's what our Hive and Pig training is about. Hive and Pig are higher-level software systems that ship as part of Cloudera's distribution for Apache Hadoop. Um, and they essentially implement common MapReduce patterns and common data management strategies that make you much more productive at working on top of Hadoop. If you are an analyst, someone who has a sort of a uh, data analysis background, if you work with tools like SAS or R or Python to do data analysis, this is where you're going to want to start. If you're not a software engineer, this is the training course for you. All right. Now at the top of the stack, we have our Introduction to Data Science course. The objective of this course is to build a complete end-to-end -end solution. Everything from data ingestion, how do I load data into Hadoop at all, to data cleansing and data formatting, to choosing a good machine learning model, the right machine learning model for your problem, to building machine learning models, to evaluating their performance, to deploying them to production. Every single thing, an end-to-end -end problem solving process. The focus of our Introduction to Data Science course is building recommender systems. So a recommender system like a movie recommender system at Netflix or a product recommendation system at Amazon. Uh, recommendations are a great problem to start with. There's no Java programming required for our data science course. Um, everything is done in terms of Hive, uh, Pig, Python, higher level tools like that. Um, and it's a great way to understand every sort of different aspect of Hadoop, um, how the different pieces fit together, um, and how they can be used to create value for your business. Recommendation problems occur in uh, just about every industry, every single field of human endeavor. Uh, everything from medicine to retailing to high finance, just about everything you can think of, building recommender systems will be very useful to you in your day-to-day -day work. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm sure the instructor or administrator there will be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot.